All right. Am I on? I'm on. That's great. Uh, good morning, guys. Uh, everybody, thanks for coming out. Uh, I know it's early, and probably everybody was out partying last night, so I didn't actually get to attend uh, Skrillex, but except on the 26th floor, I actually could hear Skrillex, so um, I was included. I was part of the party. So uh, John Handler, I'm a, a solution architect with Amazon Web Services, and um, it's been a really a tremendously exciting year for Cloud Search. Um, really happy to share with you a ton of the developments and uh, new features that we've brought out this year. Um, about 25 new features for Cloud Search, and we'll go over all of those and, and go into a good deal of depth uh, on a, a bunch of those features. So, first thing I want to ask is, uh, who is a Cloud Search user, current user? Okay, so maybe half of the audience. Um, so this is a deep dive talk, and I promise you we will go deep, but uh, let's make sure for the half of the audience that has not used Cloud Search, we just cover a little bit of the basics. I promise I'll be quick. So you have a big pile of data, and you want to search that data. And uh, generally speaking, you, know, you, you want to get that data into a format and send it into a search engine, right? So with Cloud Search, what we do is you create what we call a search domain. With your domain, you get two endpoints. Uh, one of those is a document endpoint. This is a, a, uh, an endpoint exposed through DNS. The interaction is RESTful. So um, you structure your documents, and you send them off to your document endpoint. At the other end of it, uh, you have a search endpoint. And we provide a query language that allows you to write queries against that data. And really, the point of a search engine is a search engine will bring back the most relevant results for those queries. It's a little bit of a way to differentiate from a database. In a database, uh, you send a query, and you receive all of the answers. With a search engine, you send a query, and you receive the best answers. And the relevance itself is a function that you can either write, or there's built-in uh, statistical relevance functions that sort your documents for you according to the query. And ultimately, the point is, um, as you integrate with your application or your website, um, that you drive engagement through getting people to the data that they're interested in and the, the products that they want to buy or what have you. And this is, um, you know, drives engagement, sells your products, and that. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Amazon Cloud Search. And again, it's been a really exciting year. Uh, we've, as I said, 25 products new released, released this year. But looking at sort of the arc of where we're coming from, uh, in 2012, what was that? Uh, in 2012, we released Amazon Cloud Search based on the proprietary A9 engine. And uh, what we found, you know, our customers really demanded both more features and kind of a lower cost structure. So. Um, we have started moving in an open source direction. We actually took Apache Solar, <coughs> pardon, and uh, brought it in as our core search technology. And what we really see as our core mission is to make the process and the operation of a search engine, getting it up and running, uh, making it highly available, uh, monitoring and uh, making it self-healing, keeping the cluster up and running, we see that as our core mission and our core value add. So that's really where we look to bring uh, value and features. OK, so um, in March of this year, again, we brought out our solar product. And I'm going to be putting up a couple of pro tips here and there. Um, you know, I was just talking with a couple of customers in the audience um, who have migrated from the older version to the newer version. And uh, consensus was, great idea, migrate forward to the newer uh, API of Cloud Search. So just some of the things that we've come out with um, with that version. So as I mentioned, more features. And actually, we find that there's a lower cost structure. So if you're running on the 2011 version uh, and you migrate forward to 2013, we see uh, quite a bit of savings just in that step alone. We also have a ton of new features. 
So uh, we have additional data types. The original version was somewhat limited in the data types. Most importantly, we do support now natively dates and uh, geo types, as well as some additional numeric types. Uh, out of the box, one of the big customer asks was that we would support more than just English. Original version was just English. Uh, the newer version supports 34 different languages. We also added uh, some critical sort of search UI features like highlighting and uh, search suggestions, which support things like a type ahead or an autocomplete feature. Uh, we have some solar features in there like term boosting, fuzzy matching. And we also continue to innovate on the operational front. So we have uh, IAM integration, full IAM integration, down to the ability to control the search and uh, document updates, integration with the AWS SDK and the common CLI to let you script it up, um, and a host of others. So we're going to go into depth on those. And you know, as I talk to customers and as, as I hear where people are running into problems, uh, I thought it over and I tried to sort of bucket it out and figure out where are the places that people uh, kind of typically run into issues. So uh, these are the buckets that I came up with. Um, as simple as it is to get started with Cloud Search, a lot of people run into issues with getting everything set up and getting their data in. So we're gonna spend a little time talking about how do we do that in a good way. Scaling is a huge topic, and um, we've, we've released a feature that lets you set uh, a minimum on your scale. But this has also caused a lot of confusion because people don't know, well, how to think about how big do I need to get. So we're going to have quite a bit of detail on scaling. Uh, we're going to talk through some of the new query interface. And then we'll also talk about some common architectural patterns that I run into. OK, so let's uh, dive into this first topic of setting up. Um, to get set up with Cloud Search, you know, what you want to do, first of all, is you want to create your search domain. Uh, you want to configure it, and then you need to take your documents and create uh, batches out of those documents. Now, the document is the core object or the core entity of the search engine. So in this step, what you're really going to do is you're going to take your data, build it into a format or a set of entities that Cloud Search can search over, and then you're going to, um, well, you're going to secure your domain as well, and then you're going to upload that uh, set of documents to the search engine so that you can search against them. And the last thing is you want to actually monitor uh, the security and want to make sure that uh, the access to that domain is the intended access. So again, one of our big features we uh, released uh, was the integration with the AWS Common CLI. Um, we have the AWS Cloud Search command, uh, and this allows you to do all of the administrative tasks. And you know, here, what I recommend, one common thing that we hear is that uh, people want to either copy or take a, a dev, a, Q, a QA environment, and a prod environment, and they want to be able to copy the configuration forward. So my recommendation is to set this all up in a script, um, and then you can script up your, your index configuration. It lets you, you can run that script and just uh, copy out a, a new version of your domain. As simple as it seems, um, taking your data and getting it into Cloud Search format actually is a stumbling block for many people. Um, there's a lot of different places that this happens, but we're just going to look at the general pattern of what you need to do to get your data in. So what I've done is I actually uh, downloaded a bunch of tweets, and I had them on my local file system. So I wrote a script where uh, I just walked uh, that directory and opened each of the files and read all of that data in. Now, the pattern is the same whether you have a streaming API, you may have objects in S3, you may have objects in a, a, a relational database. The pattern is I'm going to go to my object store or stores, open that store up, and then one at a time pull objects out of there. Uh, for each one, I'm actually going to do a conversion from the original form to the form that Cloud Search expects. And um, once I fill up my batch, Cloud Search document endpoint is a batch uh, API. Once I fill up my batch, then I will flush it out. Uh, I chose to flush it to my local disk. You can actually use the SDK or uh, another HTTP transport method to push it straight to your domain. 
uh, whichever way you'd like to do it. One of, this, is, this is maybe the most important thing that I can tell you this morning. So one of the most important things. So uh, as I said, Cloud Search has a uh, batch format for its document uploads. We, the batches themselves can be up to five megabytes, and uh, within that batch, you can have as many documents as will fit in five megabytes. So the, you'll get absolutely the best performance if you put as many documents in your batch as possible. Sometimes what we've seen is that people who are sending single document batches will see the times increase for how long it takes to deploy uh, those documents to the running index. So to get the best throughput and to get the lowest latency on your updates, use the maximum batches. OK, so um, we've walked the file, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about the data conversion. Um, so the first thing that, that you need to do, much of this data can come from uh, users. So it can be user-generated data. Could be coming from some kind of legacy system. Uh, and it could have uh, bad characters in it. Actually, typically, it has at least a bunch of some bad characters in it. And bad characters here, Cloud Search accepts uh, all of the Unicode characters except for those that are illegal XML. Uh, but all of the Unicode characters uh, encoded as UTF-8. If the coding's off or if the characters are bad, uh, things will fail, and it is confusing. Many people get confused by this. So the first really important thing is to clean the text and make sure that all of the characters are valid characters. Cloud Search documents have an ID, and the ID is what identifies that document uniquely within the search engine. For me, it was fairly easy. I have tweets. Tweets have IDs. So I simply pulled out the tweet ID as my document ID. Um, if there are, you can do almost anything with the ID. Uh, if it's you know, from a database, you may have a, a row identifier. You may have, you can hash up something and just have a random value in there either, but it has to be consistent. The next thing we want to do, Cloud Search um, is a denormalized format uh, for documents. So we don't support a nested document type. Tweets actually are nested. They have a user section, and they have a retweeted section. So uh, you want to go in and pull out all of those additional uh, pieces of metadata and bring them up to the top level. And again, this is true if you have uh, nested documents in any format. You want to go in and, and denormalize them and pull all that data up to the top. Finally, there's some additional stuff in there that we don't care about, so we'll throw that stuff away. And in the end, uh, what we get is a set of fields. Uh, this is the, the format that I was talking about. I have a class that I wrote that just puts out the correct JSON. But fundamentally, we have a set of fields and values that have been sourced from the tweet. As I mentioned, we have uh, CLI integration. Now, the important thing is we have two commands in the AWS CLI. A lot of people have missed the second command. Um, so there is a AWS Cloud Search domain, uh, what is it, Cloud Search domain uh, client. And then this one is the one that you call to do uh, document uploads, searches, and suggests. So you can do all those through the CLI, but you have to use the right command. CLI responds, yes, I uploaded 5,000 some documents. Another great thing that we came out with this uh, year is IAM integration for across all of Cloud Search commands. We had already uh, integration for configuration commands. We now have integration for search, doc, and suggest. So you can set up your IAM security uh, resource-based policy like this attaches to a resource. This allows you to specify for a domain either the actors or the uh, IP addresses that are allowed to connect to that domain, uh, in this case for the actions of search and suggest. You can also set it up user-based. And uh, user-based policy, again, this, this confuses me endlessly. The user-based policies don't have users. They attach to users, right? So uh, the user-based policy attaches to a user. With this, you can control what that particular user can do. Um, and you can see here, you specify the ARN Amazon resource name for your domain, and then you can specify the actions for that user. So you also want to uh, monitor and make sure that uh, you know, people are accessing your domain in the way that you intend. Uh, this, this year, we also released integration with CloudTrail for um, configuration commands. So these are the describe star and update star, delete star. Uh, we are pushing uh, logs to CloudTrail. And 
I just have an example there, it's really small. Don't worry about it. Just wanted to show you what kind of comes out of Cloud Search. This is a described domains call. So you can use CloudTrail to do the normal mo uh, auditing and monitoring of the access to your domain. Secure and monitor your domain. And when, when you look at the different policies and what you can accomplish with them, uh, what we typically would, would see is that your search and suggest uh, commands should be fairly wide open. This will allow a broad range of people to connect and do searches. If you have, for instance, a mobile application, uh, you may want to open it all the way up just to let people connect directly. Um, the doc service, you want to keep that one really tightly locked down. That's the one where uh, if somebody is uploading documents to your domain that's not you, not a good thing. Don't want to do that. And then, uh, as I mentioned, with the user-based policies, you can actually build up a set of policies for different uh, business classes of users. So if you have, say, somebody who is uh, an operator, they would need to do something like maybe scale domains. Um, you could have uh, devs who want to have full access to the range of cloud search commands. You could have business owners that are able to set up uh, either uh, we'll list out all the domains and, and do some monitoring on them. OK, first big topic. So thinking about scaling, um, as I said, we released a feature that lets you set the minimum instance type and the minimum number of replicas for that instance type. And what does that mean, and how do I think about that, and how do I understand uh, what numbers I should use for that? So there's a couple of cases where you definitely want to think about scaling. And the first one of those is when you're loading in data, and we'll cover that one, and we'll cover how you do that. And then th if you're going to anticipate a traffic spike, uh, you also want to scale in that case, and we'll cover that too. So the f when you create a cloud search domain, your search domain starts on a single small. And we have a, a number of people who have uh, large data sets, hundreds of gigabytes, and they're starting out on a small. If you try to sh stick hundreds of gigabytes through a small, the experience is pretty rocky, right? What happens, again, you start on a small, and now Cloud Search will automatically, as you push data in, scale you to a large, uh, an extra large, a double extra large, and then partition out. But all of this, there's a, there's a somewhat slow reaction time. And you want to be able to uh, scale yourself up beforehand. So this is a uh, large-ish table. And what I've done here is I've taken each of the instance types, and I've maximally loaded it with two different data sets. Okay? The Twitter data is mostly metadata and a small amount of text. The common crawl data is from a web crawl, and it's a data set available on AWS. Uh, the common crawl data is larger documents, about 6K average, with fewer metadata. So we have two kind of different document types. And you can see the results are actually a little bit different. For the tweets, if we look at the 2X larges, uh, we can get 107 gigs of tweets into a single 2X large. Um, whereas with the common crawl data, we can get 64 gig into, uh, into the, the 2X large. Uh, the asterisk there is each partition of 2x larges would take uh, that amount of data. So when you're thinking about it, you can use this as sort of a baseline or for your thinking about how do I scale up for my load in. And what's going on here? What's the difference really between the tweets and the uh, common crawl data? When your data comes in, what Cloud Search does is creates a, a data structure called an inverted index out of that data. The size of that thing is dependent on, number one, the number of different words, and then number two, the number of occurrences of those different words. So when you have text, you have something that's dense with words and occurrences of those words. The index structure itself actually is quite a bit larger than when you have a, a more uh, sparse version of text, like with metadata or short tweets, right? Um, eventually, those go onto the node. The other important thing to think about is options. So with the Cloud Search configuration, you can actually set uh, different options on your search fields. And as you set those options, those have various costs in terms of index space. So what I did here is with the common crawl data, I started out with all of the options off. 
and I took a baseline index size. Then I turned on all of the options and took an index size for that. And what you find there is that with all of the options on, it's about two and a half times as big. Um, I then went one by one and turned on the options and compared them to the baseline no option index size. In this case, you can see that highlight uh, is most of what the all options case is. Um, and return is also a large portion of that. Now, when you turn on highlight, actually, you're also turning on return. So that's why you have a little bit of overlap there. You can see the, oh, there it goes, that using the sort uh, is fairly inexpensive, and using facet is very inexpensive. So if you're thinking about costing, and you have uh, some higher costs, and you want to turn off some options to optimize that cost, uh, you look first at the highlight, and make sure that you're using highlight in cases where you really need it. Uh, and then look at return. It's also a big uh, a chance to really drop your index size quite a bit. Another question that comes up a lot is, well, can I multi-thread against Cloud Search? And the answer here is yes, you can multi-thread. And what I have up on the screen is the number of threads that we run on each of the instance types to accept document service connections. So uh, smalls, we have two, then five, nine, and 17. And the recommendation here is if you're going to multi-thread against an instance of that type, that you use these uh, numbers, one, three, five, and nine threads. You can push it harder, and what you would see is if you put too many threads against it, you'll start getting 500 errors. So you can use that to sort of dial in uh, the maximum uh, throughput. Okay, so all of this, let's take an example to kind of make it a little bit more concrete. Let's say you have 150 gigabytes of data that you want to load into Cloud Search. So what I typically use is 64 gig as a uh, baseline kind of common number for what I would expect to get onto a 2x large. So if I say, okay, well, I'll get 64 gigs and I have 150, probably what I need is three partitions of 2x larges. So I'd scale myself up to three partitions. And with those three partitions, I could run 27 concurrent threads to push all that data in. How do I do that is the first thing I want to do is, again, scale up my domain. And when I, when I issue the command to uh, update scaling parameters, my, my domain will require an indexing. So I scale up my domain and I index it. When it comes in with the three hosts, I can then load in my data. So I can push it in as fast as I can. Now, if you are pushing at a maximal velocity like this, your searches will be uh, somewhat wonky. They really will. Um, but is, as this is a data load, typically that's not gonna matter. If you just wanna get your data in as fast as possible, scale it up, push it as fast as you can, and then what you wanna do is set it back to the, to the defaults or the minimums. So uh, in this case, I set it back down to an M1 small and a partition one. So why did I do that? Well, Cloud Search, it, you're setting a floor on scaling. So this is not saying make my domain a single M1 small. It's saying make it minimum an M1 small. Cloud Search will take all of that data you pushed in, and when you, when you run your index documents, Cloud Search will then pick the right deployment for you. So if it actually went on three, you'll go on three. If it actually went on six, you'll go on six, right? And if it went on one, you'll go on one. Um, so this second step allows Cloud Search to resize the index, repartition it, and get it ready to go. So frequently you'll be running along at a fine clip and uh, you have some, you know, something that's coming up, Super Bowl, or you know, a big ad release, or something like that, and you know you're gonna have some kind of traffic spike. And you wanna warm for that traffic spike, uh, because Cloud Search will respond, but if it's a very spiky behavior, Cloud Search takes five, 10 minutes to scale up, and if you wanna be ready, uh, you can now pre-scale for that. So just looking at how Cloud Search scales, let's say I have my three partitions, and I have a certain set of CPUs. Every query goes to every partition. So the CPUs are, are sort of joined um, to serve that query. The query itself will take some amount of CPU. And as I push more traffic in, uh, what happens is that CPU becomes loaded. When it gets loaded, Cloud Search will then add additional hosts, replicas of those partitions. So I'll essentially get more CPU to serve each partition. If I keep sending data, that'll keep coming in. 
Of course, Cloud Search is elastic, will also scale down when, you, uh, when your load drops. So scaling for queries, we add partitions. I did some testing to uh, come up with what is the capacity of each of the uh, instance types. And I have to put a ton of caveats here. Uh, this is with you know, my test data and my test queries. So my test data in this case, again, Twitter and Common Crawl. Um, and I also generated 10,000 one, two, and three word queries. And the, I used the simple query interface, just Q equals and some text. This would probably represent something like an upper bound on what you could get, but I actually got these numbers. So uh, I ran JMeter uh, with a script called JMeter EC2. It's kind of groovy, it's a little bit kind of old school, but it's a bash script that uh, fires up EC2 instances for you, puts everything on them and runs it. Um, so with the M1 smalls, I used two hosts and 10 threads, and I was able to achieve uh, 25 or 48 QPS for the different data sets, and uh, those are the average uh, query times. And you can see as it scales up, I use four hosts, 20 threads, I get 108, and on the big end, I got 566 and 985. These actually were somewhat surprising to me. I would expect them to be about half as big in a normal use case. One of the things that happened here is because I had multiple hosts running the same query set, um, I actually was benefiting from the caching in Solar. So if in your case, if you do have a big uh, common data uh, query load and you have a long tail, um, you, you may get something like this. Anyway, I wanted to, to sort of point at it and say, okay, here's at least one test case where uh, with my queries, I got these, uh, these response times and throughputs. So again, let's take an example. Let's say you're going along at a good clip and you know that your single M1 small can, can take 20 queries per second of your traffic. And you know, okay, I'm gonna go up to 75 queries per second, that's my forecast, right? So what I'm gonna do in that case is I'm gonna use my update scaling to add additional replicas. I would set my minimum replicas to three on the somewhat optimistic hope that there's a little bit above that 20 uh, QPS, and three should probably be able to handle it. The other thing um, that I don't particularly have a slide for is uh, all of those numbers are good if you're trying to cost out a Cloud Search use case. So uh, you, can, you can use those numbers and, and figure out, okay, well I have 500 gig of data and I know about 64 gig to a 2X large, that should put me on about eight partitions uh, to sort of size out the number of partitions. Same thing for query traffic. Uh, you can use these as a guess to try to figure out how much it's gonna cost. I have a quick uh, walk through the query interface. The 2013 API, we uh, really released something that is a lot more solar in flavor, so the syntax is different. Uh, in the migration, this is one of the steps that you'll have to make, is to uh, change your queries to the new query format. So uh, we have a simple queries, same thing, Q equals with a piece of text. Uh, this is against the Twitter data set, so if I say IDK, I get, I don't know if it's yummy or what, lol, I'm hungry. Um, we also uh, do support structured queries, and the way we've handled this is we now have a q.parser parameter that lets you specify that you want to use a structured query. So this query looks for I don't know within the country of the United States, and that gives me I don't know what it is, but something's different. Um, we also uh, have a number of different query options that you can specify. There are, number, there are a number of different parsers. We also support the Lucene parser and the Dismax parser out of Solar. Uh, I can set options. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm specifying which fields I wanna search. Uh, the fields are the text and also the user description. And then I can set weights on those fields uh, to boost their value in scoring them. So in this case, I've multiplied my text by four, my user description by half, um, this is a typical thing that I would do with titles and bodies or uh, other things where there's a, a more important piece of text, I can boost that up. Uh, in this case, I get the, as you can see, the I don't know uh, gets heavily weighted in the text, so we get really lots of occurrences of that. We did release uh, native geo support, so um, you know, how do I do geo? 
Um, we have a Latlon data type, a native data type that lets you specify a Latlon pair. Uh, in this case, I can filter my queries across a range of latitudes and longitudes. This gives me a nice bounding box, so I can search, in this case, near Pac Bell Park in San Francisco. Um, between those latitudes and longitudes, search for baseball and use the structured parser. Um, and then I find, I love talking baseball with my dad. The FQ there is somewhat confusing to people. So now we have a Q and we have an FQ. So what's the difference and which one do I use? Well, the FQ um, is used strictly for filtering. So it's the matches for an FQ do not count towards the score. That's the main difference between them. The other is that filters are actually a little bit faster. Um, there's code in solar that actually aggressively uh, caches filters. So what I've done here is I've actually run uh, a Q query and then an FQ query that was equivalent. And then actually because, um, because I wanted to really see the value of the caches, I actually ran only 10 queries with uh, the, the same FQ. And the lines there, you have the green line is the 90th percentile, the red line is the uh, average, and the blue line is the 50th percentile. So you can see it's, it's nearly twice as fast in the you really got good use of the cache case. Um, again, use, use filters when you can. Um, they support the structured query language. So you can use ands, ors, nots. You can build up complex filters uh, and run them. The other thing that you can do with our uh, geo data type is you can uh, sort by distance. So we've exposed a function, the Haverstein distance function. This is a big, hairy piece of math that uh, tries to take into account the, the, the curvature of the Earth at the particular latitude or longitude, wherever you are. Um, but it's, fair, it's really easy to use in cloud search. Uh, you just put in the target latitude and longitude, again, Pac Bell Park, um, and then the geo is the field on the document. So this will, expression will calculate for each document that matches the distance to Pac Bell Park. And then I uh, use my sort uh, parameter to say, okay, I want to sort by that distance, right? So I use a, a bounding box filter and then sort by distance. I get all of the matches that are close to Pac Bell Park sorted by how close they are to Pac Bell Park. I use a structured parser. Uh, I can return text. Still can't believe it. What a game. Can't wait for Tuesday, et cetera. So another feature we released was uh, term boosting. This is very useful if you have a personalization use case where you know something about your particular user who's querying. You, um, you want to sort of boost up matches for brands or uh, things that they like. So uh, if I just search for baseball, I get a bunch of tweets about baseball. I can also use this syntax to search the hashtag fields for SF Giants and boost that up by four. This syntax works um, in, the, in the structured query parser. Um, and in, that, in this case, I actually boosted it up so high I got only SF Giants. But you can use ORs here, and you can uh, allow that, that weight to play with the kinds of matches that come back uh, for that user. I mentioned we support 34 languages. Um, I would be remiss if I did not talk about how we support those languages. So our approach to languages is we take all of the text processing uh, parameterization for how to deal with a particular language, and we put it in something that we call an analysis scheme. So the analysis scheme, I give it a name. I can set the language there. Um, and then this is half of the menu, so you can see some of the examples of the languages we support. I can also set uh, stop words for that language and uh, stems. We have algorithmic stemming depending on language. We have different levels of stemming available. And also, I can set up synonyms through a synonym dictionary. So all of this will be then in my configuration. I take that and I apply that language to a particular field. Tweets actually come with a language of the tweet uh, in all of that metadata. So one of the usual ways to handle a multilingual case like that is to split out each of the languages into a different field. We'll talk about there's another way you can handle that, and there's some trade-offs and pluses and minuses for that. But 
Um, in this case, what I did is I created a text field in each of the languages. As I'm processing the tweet, I'm going to split it out. I'm going to say, OK, this is a French tweet, so I'll stick it into the French text field. Then my queries, if I know my querier is querying in French, then I'll query just against that field. Or I can use a mix of weights uh, and query against all of those text fields if I don't know the language. You can also use the AWS uh, SDK for searching. And uh, we now have, again, a split in the classes that are available. So we have the Amazon Cloud Search client. We also have the Amazon Cloud Search domain client. Um, very important. Some people, again, have missed this. Uh, you can use the domain client to send search requests and document requests to your Cloud Search domain. And uh, what, what I've done here, it's fairly simple. I use my, uh, prop, my profile credentials provider. This is a newer one that, that uses a, uh, an AWS profile to grab the creden credentials. Um, user profile there should be replaced with the name of an actual profile. Um, I set an endpoint. There's a nice interface in the search request class for Java um, that lets me set facets and filters and all of the other stuff uh, through individual methods. So I can build up a query fairly easily. I set my query, and I can just send it off with uh, the, the search. This is useful. The, the most useful part about the SDK is it will do all of the signing for you. So uh, now with the IAM integration, you, sh you should send signed requests. Uh, the SDK can, can help with all of that, do the, the signing for you. And again, uh, you have the CLI available, uh, Cloud Search Domain Client. You can just send queries to it. OK, switching gears a little bit, I wanted to talk about some of the common questions that come up around architecting and some of the data and operational kind of architectures that uh, people ask about. And one is, well, should I cache? Should I put a cache in front of my search engine? And this is very much like with a database. Uh, with a database, you can, you, you can employ a cache to increase the throughput and decrease the load on your database server. Same thing is true with search. The pattern here is what you do is you take the query, full text of the query, use it as a key, give it a time to live that uh, makes sense for your application in the, in the presence of how often you update things. And then when a search request comes in, you hit the cache first with that query. If you got the response, send it back out. Uh, if not, send it to the search engine and then uh, back out to the user and then cache it off. So again, you can uh, decrease the load on your search domain, and that becomes important if you're handling a large volume of queries. Uh, you'll see a much lower load on your search domain and potentially a lower cost because of that. You'll, you'll, miss some, you'll be able to avoid some replication. Another area, and this one comes up many times in many different ways, and fundamentally the question is, well, I have this heterogeneous data set. So I'm a SaaS provider. I have N customers. I am uh, doing tweets, and I have N languages. I am running an e-commerce site, and I have books, movies, music, CDs, et cetera. So how do, I take, well, how do I handle all of this heterogeneous data? What do I do with it? There's two answers, and the first answer is a collocation. So what you can do is you can take all of those documents, all of them, and put them into one domain. You use a single field on your documents with some kind of identifier. Uh, if it's a SaaS provider and I have a customer ID, I can use my customer ID on each of the documents for that customer. I then send a filter. With each query, I add a filter query with the customer ID, and that restricts the matches for that query to specifically that customer. The other solution for this is to employ a multi-domain solution. So I can take each of my customers and put them on a separate search domain. I then use the different endpoints to route my queries based on my uh, customer ID or document type or language or et cetera. But how do you really think about uh, what's, the, what's the way to choose between them? And the, the big points, the major bullets are, you know, if you have a high number of tenants, say a million, then spinning up a million search domains is not really going to be cost effective. So if it's a high number of tenants, you definitely think about a single domain solution. 
And you have a large variation in how those tenants perform. So if I have 100 customers, but one customer sends 1,000 queries per second, and you know, 50 customers send one or fewer queries per second, so I have variation there, then I would tend to think of splitting them out. This also comes up in terms of schema. If I have, uh, my customers have very different schemas, or my books, movies, CDs, et cetera, have very different schemas, um, I would tend to split them out, especially if those schemas are changing at a, a high rate. Every time you do a schema change, you have to rebuild your document. If everything is in the same domain, then you're paying the cost of rebuilding everybody's data when anybody's schema changes. So you really want to, in that case, you want to say, OK, pull those guys out, because they're going to generate a lot of cost for me. Where we usually end up is some kind of hybrid, where you say, OK, here's my 100 smallest customers. I'm going to put them in one domain. Here's my 20 big customers. They're each going to go in their own domain. And you manage it like that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about relevance. The you know, mining user behavior is an entire multiple PhDs worth of information that you can dig into. But there are some simple things that you can do to improve your results. The basic pattern looks like I have somebody who's interacting with my website. They're sending queries. They're clicking on things. They're buying things. So what I want to do is I want to track all of that interaction, right? Ultimately, what is the search query? What are the results for that query? Did the user click on something? Did the user buy something? At a bare bones level, you can push all of that uh, into Redshift or another data store. Um, in a sort of full-blown uh, way, a full-blown use case, you would then use EMR to crunch all that data up and uh, push it back into the application database and create it on your documents as additional scores and measures that you use uh, to change the relevance. Some of the things, again, that you can do that are a little bit simpler, um, you can do document boosting. If you're just tracking, even without that big uh, architecture, if you're just tracking which documents get clicked on and you push that back into the document itself as a, a numeric field, you can then apply that, that field in a rank expression to boost up the value of that document, always bearing in mind that uh, you don't want to have a self-reinforcing, you, you want to keep the the thing tamped down a little bit so it doesn't blow up. Um, you can also augment documents. If you happen to be tracking queries and which documents got clicked for those queries, you can add the query words to the document in a field uh, that's a keywords field or a query field. And you can use that for an additional source of matching. Again, you want to use uh, field weighting to make sure that that has a lower score um, than the main match fields. But it does provide additional evidence that people might be interested in that document. Another thing you can do is you can use the queries as a source of uh, uh, information about synonyms. If I find that uh, these query words happen together often, then, or that they're uh, corresponding in user clicks, so users searched for this and clicked on this, user also searched for that other thing and clicked on the same thing, there's evidence there that those two queries might have some synonymous information in them. So that can be a good source of where do I find synonyms. So there was a ton of information in that talk. As I said, it's been really a huge year. And um, you know, just, just some of the, the points that I'd like you to take away. Number one, migrate to the 2013 API. All of these features are 2013 API only. If you're using 2011, uh, definitely worth it to migrate. Use maximal batches, uh, you will do much better. Um, for lo data load in and um, query spikes, think about manual scaling. You now have some good numbers to go look at to figure out how big do you need to scale. Um, we have a number of different solar features. I've really scratched the surface only of our query interface. So go have a look at the documentation. There's a ton of different stuff you can do with queries. Uh, and then thinking about architecting, again, the one that comes up most often, multi-tenant domains, uh, we now have a nice way, or at least some framework, to think about uh, how to do that for your use cases. So that's it for me. Um, I, I encourage you to uh, do your feedback. Uh, the person who gets the most feedback can win a Pinto, so I'm really hoping for that. Um, 
And also we've uh, released a hands-on lab for Cloud Search that walks you through uh, the total basics of getting set up and running some queries. It's actually a pretty nice lab. Uh, I encourage you to go take that one. Um, it's, a, it's a nice one. So thank you very much for your attention and your attendance. I really appreciate it.